Welcome to the Iron Mike Keenan podcast, episode number 15. Scott Morrison along with the coach, Iron Mike. And uh, you're back on our side of the border, back in Canada now. I am and enjoying a great uh, visit here on Georgian Bay. Uh, I've had a home here for 35 years, so it's nice to be in isolation on the bay and and certainly uh, uh, a lot of chores, as you know, when you come back and have to put uh, uh, your home together in terms of preparation for winter here in the great white north. So you mentioned when we talked off air earlier today that you were spreading manure today. So with that in mind, we'll get on with the podcast. How's that? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so something a little bit different today, and I think we're going to have a, a tremendous amount of fun with this. We're going to do a little bit of rapid fire, but we're going to play name association because you've had so many great players, good players, just so many talented people and good people uh, cross your path over your career. So I just, I'm just going to throw out names and you tell us a story with everyone. And, and, I, and I'm going to start in no particular order, but uh, with a gentleman that we had on, <laughs> I think it was our second episode and I was blown away because, because it was, was a, a love fest between the two of you. And, uh, but at the, back in the day, it was butting heads and uh, everything else. But it was fabulous to hear what you guys had to say about your relationship and how it evolved. And both of you having regrets about certain elements of it. But let's start with first name, Brett Hull. Yes, uh, you captured the the essence of, of a relationship when I was coaching him certainly a gifted hockey player a talented hockey player um, uh, uh, a fellow that wasn't afraid to to say what he was thinking and uh, I had uh, less difficult difficulties with with him than than some of the other coaches like Roger Nielsen God bless his soul and Bobby Berry and Jimmy Roberts, God bless his soul as well. And, and uh, uh, he was quite confrontational in terms of wh- how he wanted uh, us to play. And, and Roger was in charge of the power play. And of course, he was a big part of, part of it, the essential part of it. And he always had an opinion that uh, was quite strong and often disagreed with Roger in his preparation of the power play. So I had to try to remind him from time to time but that he had to uh, respect the coaches. And, and we got into a couple of uh, uh, conversations, if you like, where I told him he, he better start doing what these coaches are asking him to do because to work the power play, for example, you have to have all five guys on the same page. And we had some great talent on that team. Uh, of course, Wayne Gretzky, uh, we acquire from LA and then the two guys on the point were Pronger and McGinnis. Uh, so, uh, you know, we had great ability and Shane Corson uh, was the, was part of that as well because he was the tough guy in front of the net setting up pick screens and, and, uh, but uh, we came about in the coaches, I forget who did it, but they, they described the line as the waner the shaner and the complainer. <laughs> so uh, Brett was always uh, complaining about something uh, that he didn't like the way we were playing, but uh, a talented, huge town. Of course, uh, we've built a strong relationship since those days. And I've been with them often at, in Wayne Gretzky's fantasy camps and various other charitable functions that we've attended and, and uh, just recently watching him last year playing golf out in the desert. And uh, he have his, uh, he's a tremendous talent still with the golf clubs as well. At his age, he was, he was the best amateur in the tournament that particular uh, weekend. So uh, Brett Hall uh, uh, was uh, a challenging player to coach. And I, I have to say, and I've said this publicly before, that I, I wished I would handle would have handled him differently because uh, he had so much to offer and I could have got that much more out of him if I had uh, taken a different approach to him. Uh, I can tell you a, a pretty good score, uh, story about Brett and 
Scotty Bowman. Scotty Bowman and I are longtime friends, and and uh, Brett was saying, like, the Scotty, no, I'm here. I, he's, I've been here for months now, and he, he's never even spoken to me. And I said to Scotty, that's probably what I should have done. He just gave him the silent treatment, let him talk all he wanted or complain about anything he wanted. He never even answered him. So uh, that was an interesting uh, relationship as well. But uh, again, uh, Brett had uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, uh, support by his teammates. They knew how talented he was, but was oftentimes he was challenged by his teammates as well. And, told him to zip it for a while, Brett, and listen to the coaches. So an interesting character, but a super talented, a really smart, bright guy. I'm going to probably mess up the story a little bit, but Ken Hitchcock would share your uh, memories of dealing with Brett. And uh, remember the story that Brett was on a breakaway and he fired the puck into the corner, didn't shoot at the goal. He fired the puck in the corner and Hitchcock asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, you keep telling me, get pucks deep, get pucks deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be typical uh, Brett sometimes. He was pretty stubborn. And yeah. uh, I, I understand the, the story that you're telling us that uh, Hitchcock and Hitchcock had in terms of his relationship with Brett as well. But Good Brett, a great, there, a great and, guy at heart, right? Yeah, and of course, then he wins the Stanley Cup in Dallas and scores the winning goal. In the with his big toe, with his toe in the crease. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we uh, I think as you grow older, you can appreciate uh, some of those talented people and, and that they are different. They, they are artists. He's an artist uh, mentally and, and in terms of the way he approached the game and he didn't want much structure. He wanted to run, run loose. And, and he was, uh, when he was given that ability, then he, he would do well. So speaking of artists and you brought his name up already. So we'll go down that one is Wayne Gretzky. You had him Canada cups. You had him in St. Louis. Absolutely. Uh, a gentleman and, uh, very coachable, um, man, uh, exceptionally talented, obviously. It took me about uh, four or five months to call Sam McMaster every day in Los Angeles to make that trade. And I think it probably uh, came about, Wayne probably went to him and said, I'd, I'd like to move on. I don't know that for sure, but uh, of course we acquired him and it was a big, big event for the history of the St. Louis Blues for Wayne to come to St. Louis. His wife's, Janet, was uh, from that area. And I think that had something to do with the, with the uh, ability to acquire him as well. But Wayne, such a talented uh, individual. I mean, uh, his stats speak volumes about his ability. Was he 2,000 points ahead of the next uh, competitor? Something of that nature. And uh, so as a coach with a guy like that, do you coach him? What do you say to a guy? Do you just open the door and let him go? Yeah, I can tell you, though, when when uh, it, yeah, that's exactly right. Little story about Wayne. When I did trade for him, we were playing in Vancouver. It might have been even the first game that we had him. And uh, I played him like 26 minutes that game. And and uh, he found that a little bit challenging at the time. And then after the story goes, he went to a restaurant with the guys and to go to dinner. And the waiter said, Mr. Gretzky, what would you like? And he said, a bottle of oxygen, please. So, uh, yeah, he just, uh, you know, Canada Cups. Uh, again, I, as I said, he was so coachable. Uh, he'd have uh, ideas about how we should do things, but you let him uh, do his artistry and he was so respectful and I came from his father uh, this is an interesting story too Walter in Canada Cup 87 used to drive to the rink with me quite often just the two of us in the vehicle and he turned to me one day he says you know don't give my son any special privileges I said Walter he's the best hockey player in the world he says I don't care <laughs> so uh, he had a big influence on Wayne and uh, you know they had a great deal of respect for each other, but Wayne was uh, a real gentleman and, and as you know, very 
accommodating for everyone. He, he, his teammates meant so much to him uh, because he understood that he was special in terms of his own talent, but he also understood he needed them to be that successful. And the over, support over your him. over your shoulder, we see his yeah. Team Canada jersey hanging on the on the wall from Nagano Olympics. Yeah, I was very privileged to. He sent me two uh, two uh, pieces of art, if you like. One was of him lighting the torch in Vancouver for the Olympic Games, and he describes uh, and thanks me for his support. Uh, and that he's a great friend, that I'm a great friend of his. And the other was the Olympic jersey. So uh, that was pretty special. I mean, I, again, I had coached him in two Canada Cups and in St. Louis and uh, exceptional individual and exceptional talent. So we've told the story before, but I love this story. Talk about it was at the start of training camp for the 87 Canada cup in Montreal. And that moment he stepped on the ice. Tell us that story again. Yeah, that was that. incredible. Uh, it was in the Montreal forum and uh, there were hundreds of reporters around him and he dressed. Uh, I did this intentionally in the visitor's room with what we just split the groups up. It, it wasn't, it was just random, but I made sure that Wayne was on the other side. I thought he'd get less attention. It didn't turn out that way. The hallway was packed. And the second that, and he was very accommodating and the practice was going to start at 12 noon. And it was like five seconds before the, 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 the high noon came and he stepped on his, onto the ice and his eyes just lit right up. And I said, that's it. That's where he loves to be. That's where his solace is. And that's what he enjoys the most. So, he skated right over, and it was interesting. He pushed his shoulder up against me as the coach and said, men, we'll do what this man wants us to do. And that was unbelievable for a young coach. I think I was 35 or 37 years old at the time. And uh, to have that kind of presence from the, the best player in the world supporting you and then making a point of it, uh, was exceptional, exceptional moment. So we're going to do an episode on the 87, oh, both the Canada Cups of 87, but just for now, tell the story about game three of that 87 Canada Cup against the, the Russians in the first period. You fell behind by three goals, I want to say. Down three goals, yes. And then Wayne sitting on the bench and you're looking at the other bench. Tell us that story. Yeah, the Tekin office wondering what's going on because we pretty much changed. I said, I better do something here in a hurry to make things different for us in terms of tactics. So I put out the Tockets, the Props, the Howard Chucks, God bless Dale, and the Brent Sutters and Brian Prop and played the, what we call the grinders, if you like, at that time. Dougie Gilmore, uh, it's funny for me to describe some of these players like that. but yeah, they, superstar they grinders. Play, the superstar, super superstars were, were uh, Wayne and Mario. And then, of course, Mess was on the bench and Anderson and Gartner. But Tikhanov kept looking at me and said, like, where's Gretzky? I mean, he's, he's sitting down. And uh, so we, we kind of changed the tactics and we got back in the game, as you know. And then out comes the superstars in the end and and score the big goal, but uh, the difference makers. And Wayne understood it. And, and at one time I played Wayne so much in a game, he just turned to me and says, Mike, just give me a break for a few minutes. I'm exhausted. Just give me a, a breather for a few minutes. I said, all right, so no problem. And of course, uh, he, he, the other thing about Wayne, it was quite, quite complimentary uh, to me, but he said, there's only... But one time he said, there's only two people in the world that I know of that don't need to watch a video because they got it memorized in their mind about every shift of every game, about both teams. And he said, that would be Mike Keenan and myself. So that was a pretty incredible statement. But that was, that's how his mind worked. He could, and I could memorize it as well and, and recall it. And uh, 
it was scary. I, I've been around Wayne when I brought him to St. Louis, and he'd, he'd talk about playing against my uncle, Bob. Bob Keenan was coaching in Oshawa, novice. And I was in upstate New York at St. Lawrence University going to the university, and Bob said, you, you should come up to, we, we were in Brockville, or he was in Brockville with a tournament. And he said, you should come over here and see this kid, Gretzky. I said, why? He says, oh, he's unbelievable. So I went up and watched. But Wayne described to me, without me telling him this story I just told you, that I was in the stands, he told me about a game and a player that Oshawa had, and his, his name was Grove Sutton. And I couldn't believe it. He could recall that particular game, and that was – He's now in St. Louis uh, with me, uh, already played in the NHL for so many years and is a superstar player in the world, and he's recalling this stuff that he did in Novice. So his mind is uh, – he, he can remember every shift of, and who was on the ice and what happened. And, oh, yeah, but he, we start talking about the games we are playing against them in, in, in the, the Stanley Cup Finals, as you know, in Philly – couple of times and he'd be describing the plays and I said now I understand why you why you've you you've just take, taken control of the game his mind is incredible in terms of uh, his ability his skill set to to know and to read what's going on his his greatest asset is his ability to understand the game and to read it to read exactly where everyone is for from both teams I swear that he would count players as he advanced up the ice and know who was behind him and where they were as well as the people that were in front of him. So uh, an unbelievable mind for hockey. It's a great story because they had a similar <laughs> experience with Mario Lemieux and obviously, as you say, super superstars. And when I was a young fella coaching, uh, helping to coach the Don Mills Flyers and you taught yes. at Don Mills Collegiate, not far. Yes. And uh, we played uh, Mario in the Quebec Pee Wee Tournament, 12 years old. I saw him a few years ago. I was doing an inter interview with him. And I said to him, I said, you know, all the years we've talked and met, I never brought up this story about that game. He remembered every moment in the game. It was like unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what, I guess, makes those players extra special. They are. And, they're, and uh, as you described, I mean, look at all the Hall of Famers I'd coached. And, yeah. and over my career and, and, and they, they separate themselves because of their uh, hockey IQ, their intellect, they're bright guys. And, uh, but their, their passion for the game and the way they view the game uh, separ separates them from the rest of the, uh, of the league. And, uh, but then you have the best of the best. And you just mentioned two guys, I mean, messes in that, group and there's a few like Brett all we talked about already exceptionally talented people but uh, when you're at that level and you can do the things you do sure you've got the skill set but it's the intellect the hockey IQ the and as you said the recall the memorization of how things play out and and instantly they can bring that to the surface into this talent so it's pretty well, incredible to coach people like that you just mentioned another name. So let's talk about Mark Messier. And what, what I'm curious about is how it f worked with him and Wayne, because you know, Mess was a superstar in his own right, but he was sort of in the shadow of Wayne for a while. They had so much respect for each other. Scott, it was unbelievable. And uh, I don't know if you can recall in 91, uh, Mess didn't come to training camp. He didn't want to, he was, in his flip-flop somewhere in Bahamas or someplace. I don't yes. know. And Gretz comes in and says, we got to get mess here. I said, you're right. He said, I'm going to phone him right now. So we got on the phone and phoned him and said, mess, it's the coach and Wayne, we need you. He said, I'll be right there. So he doesn't have training camp and we play, it was, we were playing the old Maple Leaf Gardens. Mess goes out and he's unbelievable. Like I said, you didn't train. You weren't even practicing. You weren't skating. 
you know, he had the, the instincts for the game as well and the, and the ability and, and uh, um, certainly the physique. Uh, but their relationship was really, really respectful. They understood how much they could win together and that they needed each other. And, and that whole team was, was built that way. I mean, you, you throw in Paul Coffey and Glenn Anderson, you're the superstar Hall of Famers on that team. There was so much respect that they had for each other. They knew that they needed each other to win like they did and, and consistently build a dynasty. Glenn did a super job. Glenn Sather handling them. And I can remember them saying, we have no days off with Glenn, zero. We practice and we play every single day. But that was one way of keeping them interested. They loved to play anyway. It was, you know, we, I think you probably recall it. Everybody rushed to watch the pregame morning skate or even go to watch them practice. The speed of the, of the practices were faster than NHL games. So, uh, and the skill and the passing, it was fun to watch them. So, and they had fun doing it. So the, the two of them combined and, and, and they're really respectful of all their team members, all of them. You could go on and on and, and mention them all because they, they, they were, were crucial. They were the top players. Uh, Wayne getting more points than Mark for sure, but they were both top players and, and they had a lot of people surrounding them and working together with them. So that, well, you, that was never an issue. And you obviously had Mark in 94 when you won the Stanley Cup with the Rangers. How important was he? How big a piece to the puzzle was he in that? Well, he was the biggest piece, and he was the conduit between the team and myself. I was not uh, – I had gotten a little bit quiet or, or not as uh, – I was tough and demanding, but in a quiet way, in a more quiet way. But when I was getting – when Mark would think that I was pushing him a little bit too hard, he'd come in and say, Mike – uh, can we back it off a, a little bit? And I'd say, okay, Mark, no problem. But will you promise me that this will be done? He says, I do. I will promise you this is what we'll have done. And he did. He had such an impact on the group. And building a relationship. I mean, I had coached him already twice in Canada Cups and coached many of the players at, and had the, the experience against many of the players in the, in the Flyers finals with the Oilers, uh, but his presence in the room and certainly uh, one player that was so important to us uh, that he schooled was Brian Leach. Brian, superstar player too, fabulous talent and, and good, great guy. But I don't think he understood at first why I was doing the things I was doing. And I think Mark really helped educate because they used to drive together to practice. And he would say, why is Mike doing this or that or whatever? And Mark would explain it to him. Or Mark would come in and be the conduit uh, with all the players. Uh, you know, we had, we had players that were, weren't playing. Like Eddie Olchek, uh, super talented guy. He got, I don't know, his X number of goals of the year before. It was unbelievable. And various other players. But he knew that the team needed role players and what everybody had to do and that Mike's going to identify the roles for you. They're going to be maybe different than you've ever had before, but we need those roles to win. And uh, we need the accountability to each other. And he made sure that happened without question that he was the biggest piece of the puzzle. An interesting story about him that you've told, but uh, in that 94 final, when you're, where you're up 3-1, Vancouver comes back, makes it 3-3. You wanted to take the team away to Lake Placid just to get away from everything. And he said, no, let's not do that. No. He, he and Kevin Lowe. And uh, he said, let's slay the dragon right here. Let's stay in the heat of it. Because as you know, there were hundreds of media every day. Oh. Hundreds. And that's not an exaggeration. No. And uh, they were all over us every day. And I thought, well, let's get away to Lake Placid and, and maybe half of them won't travel. He said, no, we're staying right here. Let's face the fire. Let's get in the fire. 
and fight fire with fire. So again, uh, you know, the great promise in the previous uh, 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 series against Jersey. And then the one thing though, that was, uh, and I'm very proud of it, uh, before game seven against Vancouver, two days before, uh, I gave them quite a long talk. And uh, Mark said it was the most powerful speech he's ever heard by anyone. So that was an indication that we really were on the same page and uh, acknowledged it with the team. So uh, that it was just a, a, a uh, an address to diffuse the, the, the pressure that was put on them. Uh, you know, the, the summarize the, the speech in a few seconds here is that, you know, if anybody at the beginning of the year before training camp started in our very first meeting, and I don't know if you re would remember this, but I showed them a parade mm -hmm. of the baseball team because there was no parades of the hockey team. They hadn't won. And I said, four years. Uh, 54 years, I said, if anyone at that time would have told you, you're going to play game seven at home for the Stanley Cup, would you take it? Absolutely, yes. So of all the ups and downs we've gone through here in the playoffs, the disappointments, the setbacks, and, the, and I, I hear the coaches now talk about some of the adversities that they faced in the two finalists. That's what happens. You have to respond to it. It's not what happens. It's how you respond to it. And uh, that type of leadership uh, gets you through, as, as I said, and you just uh, uh, reiterated what the remarks were of Mark to, no, let's stay in New York. We're going to win it right here, and we're going to stay in this heat. And and, so you and did. That, that not the, the figure of the heat, the, the, the media. So. Yeah. That was challenging, but uh, they, they, he, he wanted, he wanted that type of, he wanted the players to understand what was at stake. We're not going to, we're not running away from anything. So we know how great he was as a player. Uh, the stories of his leadership, as you've just shared, how nasty was he as a player? He was really, really nasty. <laughs> I mean, I seen him. And, and honest to God, I thought he broke Mike Medano's neck in Dallas. And I, a quick story. So Michael, who could really skate and fly, Mike Medano, and he is turning his head a little bit. And Mark now is coming diagonally across the neutral zone. And Mike doesn't see him. And Mark hit him so hard. I thought he literally snapped his neck right there. He went down at the blue line, the offensive blue line, and there was a, a trail of blood from there to the goal, the goal line. He had slid with that much power. And uh, they brought out, I don't know if you recall this, but they brought the ambulance out, or the, the gurney and they took Michael off and it was on the jumbotron. And then they dropped him getting into the ambulance. But... Uh, he shared no one. I'm, I'm telling that story about Mike Madonna because Mike Madonna was a superstar. I seen him, you know, hit other people and, and they were delirious for, I'm sure, weeks. Uh, we can tell the story. Mark Howell in that first series, and he knew, he knew, like Mark Howell was my best player in Philly in the, in the series. First shift, he hammered Mark. Mark pulled his groin. It was half skating on one leg, basically. I said, Mark, you're better on one leg than anybody else we have. But he, there's just an example. He knew how to win, and he knew what he had to do. And he, had, he showed no mercy to anyone. It didn't matter who you were. Once you put that gear on and that uniform, it wasn't the same color as his, then you're in trouble. And people, and that stare, everybody under, remembers that the, I mean, the, the intensity, the focus, his eyes like were beady. And I'm sure that he's intimidated a lot of hockey players, but he backed it up too. I mean, he, he was, uh, I, I, I don't know if you know, you can remember this either, but Kasparitis, Darius Kasparitis was playing for the Islanders in our first series. Mm -hmm. And he low bridged Mark and Mark came out pounding like a pistol and just took him down in a second. He's a big, strong man. Casparitis and 
I never seen Mark, like he was, he threw about 10 punches before Darius even knew what happened. He was down and out. So, you know, you didn't go near him either. He, he made sure those elbows, I guess Gordy Howe is famous about his elbows, but I think Mark Messier would be on a parallel or equal, if not better than, well, Gordy was special too, but, and mean, and so was Mark. And I think there's a few Russians that still feel his elbows in yeah. those Canada Cups. Some yes. turning points, though. Yeah. Well, that was that was interesting. You watch that hockey today, and I hadn't watched it until uh, a year ago. I'd never replayed that final game. And one of my buddies from St. Lawrence, Al Howes, came and brought a copy of the game. He said, let's watch this. I couldn't believe how vicious it was for both. <laughs> Both sides. I mean, Fatisov was was impaling people with his stick, and right down the line, everybody. It was unbelievable how vicious and mean it was. And, and again, uh, we look back at Wayne and Mary. I mean, Mary, a big man, but they they knew how to elude all this too. Like nobody hit Wayne. I don't. Wayne got hit once in the Canada Cup ninety one. Ninety one. Yeah. But about Suter, but. I hadn't seen him get hit very often because he knew where everybody was all the time and what they could do and who, who particularly was on the ice when he was out there. So, but yeah, uh, some uh, incredible stories about, and we'll get into a Canada cup set session sometime, but uh, yeah, great stories. So we're just, we'll wrap on one more thought. We're going to keep talking about, these great players and great stories. We've got Chelios, Mark Howe, you mentioned, Jeremy Roenick, Goulet, Larmer, Belfour, Hash, the list oh, goes on. Oh, oh. Chris Bronger wins the Hart Trophy after Bronger. they trade him or get him in a trade for, for Shanahan. So, But one uh, last thought on lot, Mark. A lot, lot to talk about. One last thought on Mark. is I, I've never seen it happen before. And in that 94 Stanley Cup final, he brought you the cup. I've yeah, never was, seen that happen. That was incredible. I, I'd never seen it happen. I, I didn't know what was happening. I was standing there. Obviously, I, I didn't. And at that time, I don't know why. A lot of coaches jump on the ice now and run out on the ice. I, I, I did eventually. But I just stood there to embrace the moment. And with my other coaches, Coley Campbell, Dick Todd, and this, our training staff and all sports staff were on the bench. And, and your daughter I, was there too. And my daughter was I, that when, when we won, I went right to the uh, exit and asked the guards to get my daughter and bring her on the bench with me. Uh, I think she was 14 at the time, but she was standing there beside me. And if you see photos of me and Mark comes across and he's coming at me and I'm wondering what's going on like quickly. And all of a sudden, he hands me the cup. And when he handed it to me, it felt like a feather. I just instantly, with gratification, lifted it up. And it was like the roof was going to come off Madison Square Gardens. It was unbelievable, the volume and the noise. And there's a photo of a young girl in a, in a denim dress skirt outfit on and taking the photo. That was my daughter taking the photo of me as he handed it to me and and you're right i had never seen it before and i don't think i've ever seen it since and then of course i went out on the ice and, and embraced a lot of the players after but then the other coaches had it and, and neil smith had it and, and uh and then it got back to the players but yeah that was an incredible special moment that i'll never forget and and i'm like these superstar players are so coachable and respectful it's unbelievable i don't know if i can express it in this conversation of how i feel about them yeah all right well that's a great memory and a great way to finish off this episode and uh, as i mentioned we're going to be talking about a lot of other superstars and stories of your past with them so uh that's it for episode 15 and we'll look forward to more good stories in number 16 I'm sure we'll, we can share a lot of information with our, with our listeners or our viewers that uh, they haven't heard a lot of things about these great hockey players and even the role players. I can tell you about the role players on a team and, and the tough guys and 
and uh, we'll hit them all. We'll get into it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Stay yeah. safe, everyone.